weather. Whether you love it or hate it, we have to fly through it. Might as well learn what makes it happen. Our atmosphere is composed of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and then 1% of carbon dioxide and other trace gases. As we go up in altitude, that concentration stays the same, but the pressure decreases. Our atmosphere is split up into four different layers, starting with the troposphere, and that's where most of the weather happens. In the troposphere, temperature decreases about 2 degrees every 1,000 feet, and the pressure decreases about 1 inch every 1,000 feet. Now at the top of the troposphere, we have the tropopause, and that's kind of a lid or the top of the troposphere, and that's where jet streams happen. The tropopause also varies with latitude and with season and temperature. Next we have the stratosphere, and there's little to no weather up there, unless some severe thunderstorms punch up into it, and it goes up to about 160,000 feet. The mesosphere and the thermosphere are up next, but there's no weather up there, plus we can't get up there to fly anyway, so we're not going to talk about those two. All weather that we have is due to uneven heating of the Earth's surface. Looking at this picture, you can see that the same amount of sunlight at higher latitudes gets distributed over a much bigger area and doesn't heat up the surface as much. If you remember from astronomy class, our Earth is tilted about 23 degrees. So in the summertime in the North Hemisphere, the Earth is tilted closer to the Sun and gets more concentrated sunlight further north. And in the wintertime, the Earth is tilted away from the Sun up north and gets less sunlight. Once again, all weather is due to the unequal heating of the Earth. Now we all know that warm air rises, like steam from a boiling pot, but why is that? As air warms up, the molecules expand, and when they're expanded, they're a lot less dense and they're lighter than the surrounding air, and so they rise like a helium balloon. And as air cools, it becomes denser and heavier, and it sinks back down, replacing the rising warm air. At sea level, a column of air going from the surface all the way out into space weighs about 14.7 pounds per square inch. As you go up in altitude, it's about half of that at 18,000 feet or 7 pounds. We also know that the standard pressure at sea level is 2992 inches of mercury or 1013.2 hectopascals and the standard temperature is 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. As I said before, the equator gets a lot more sunlight and that's where all the warm air is. Now warm air rises, and as it does, it starts flowing towards the poles where it gets cold, sinks back down, and flows back along the surface, back to the equator. Now if the Earth stood still, that would be a perfect model. But we don't stand still, we're rotating constantly. At the equator, our Earth is spinning at about 1,000 miles per hour, while at the North Pole, it's way less than a mile. And that speed change is what's behind the Coriolis effect. If we take an air mass at the equator, it starts out with that 1,000 mile to the east velocity. As it flows north, the earth underneath it slows down and it looks like the air mass is going to the right. If you take an air mass from the north, it starts with almost no velocity. And as it flows south, the earth underneath it speeds up and the air mass takes a right hand turn again. Because of this deflection, the air actually gets deflected so much that it breaks up at about 30 degrees latitude. 60 degrees and 90 degrees, and so we have three different cells instead of one giant cell. From the equator, that warm air rises, it flows north towards 30 degrees latitude, and it sinks back down and flows back to the equator. As it flows back, it gets turned to the right, and we call that the Coriolis effect. Also, as that cold, dense air sinks at 30 degrees north, it starts flowing up along the surface as well, up until 60 degrees latitude. And as it flows north, it gets turned to the right, and you have westerly winds in the United States. So generally in the United States, whatever is west of you in terms of weather will be where you are in just a couple days. Now on a small scale, we can't see the Coriolis effect, but one fun way to demonstrate it is if you and a friend get on a merry-go-round, you know, one of those unsafe playground equipment things that probably don't exist anymore, and you stand opposite of each other, and one of you has a ball. As it rotates, you can throw the ball to your friend right across from you, and chances are it won't get to them, because as your friend moves away from where you threw the ball, it will look like everything curved to the right. Now let's talk about pressures. There's low and high pressures. And you can think about a high pressure as being a hill, and a low pressure as being a valley. And in fact, that's what it actually is. The reason there's high pressure is because there's more air on top of that spot, which means it's heavier. And in a low pressure is where there's less air above you in the atmosphere, so that's a lower pressure. 
Now, air flows from a hill into a valley or from a high pressure to a low pressure. As air flows towards a low pressure, of course, it gets turned to the right by the Coriolis effect. So what actually happens is it doesn't quite get to the middle of the low pressure, but it ends up circling counterclockwise around the low pressure. Low pressures suck air in, and if it's moist, it gets lifted up, and it becomes clouds, rain, and generally unfavorable weather. High pressures, on the other hand, usually have good weather because it's cold, dense, descending air, and it's usually dry. So high pressures have descending cold air, and it flows out from the high pressure, and as it does, once again, Coriolis effect takes over, and it rotates everything to the right, and so you have a clockwise rotation around the high, and the left counterclockwise rotation around the low. And the way I remember it is left for low. Something to kind of think about is if you're planning a flight and the weather is generally good around where you're trying to fly, and you can take advantage of the tailwind knowing which way the pressure is rotating. On the right you have a wind flow chart. It's an art project that somebody did. And you can see that around the Texas area there's a high pressure that rotates to the right clockwise, and around the Columbus area there's a counterclockwise rotation around the low. You might know that water heats up slower than land, so when you have land and water right next to it, the air over the land gets heated up more and it rises, then it flows out to the sea, gets colder, sinks back down, and it flows along the surface back to land. And that's what we call a sea breeze. It kinda stinks when you just get out of the water and it gets all cold and breezy, but at least now you know why. At nighttime, the cycle reverses, the water is still warm, but the land cools off a lot quicker, so now you have warmer air rising over the water. It flows towards the land, gets heavy and cold, and sinks down, and flows back out towards the water. So if you're on a boat next to the shore, you'll get what's called a land breeze. Because of uneven heating, things like land and water and forests and fields, they all heat at different rates, and especially closer to the ground when you're flying, maybe when you're landing, you'll see all these air pockets, or rather you'll feel them as a little bit of turbulence coming into land. Something else to keep in mind as you're coming into land, especially if the winds are a little bit strong, is that there is mechanical turbulence. All the hangars, all the buildings, the fuel pumps, all this stuff around the airport, all those things disturb the airflow patterns and they can create a little bit of turbulence. In mountainous areas, you also have updrafts on one side of the mountain and downdrafts on the other side. Usually wind blows a lot faster at higher altitudes, so it's a lot more dangerous if you're flying in mountainous areas, especially on the downwind side. A wind shear is a change of wind speed and or direction over a small area. As you can probably guess, wind doesn't all flow in the same direction. Around different pressures, different altitudes, the wind changes, and if it happens to change over a small area, where that change happens from let's say a south wind to a west wind, there's going to be a little bit of turbulence and the air will be a little bit rough. Now usually this is associated with a frontal system, a thunderstorm, or strong upper level winds, but it can really happen at any altitude, any time, and sometimes it's even due to mechanical turbulence closer to the ground. Wind shear is fairly dangerous when you're close to the ground. The reason it's so dangerous is not because of turbulence, it's because of rapidly changing performance. So wind shear by definition is a change of wind speed and or direction. So imagine you're flying along and you're on final and you have a headwind of 20 knots. Everything's going great, you have that 20 knot headwind, but then all of a sudden it changes to a 20 knot tailwind. Now 20 knots might not seem like a lot, but you just lost 40 knots. And if your approach speed is 60, now you're at 20 knots. Now wind shear can happen at any altitude, usually at higher altitudes, it's just turbulence. Now the worst type of wind shear is a microburst. You can get up to a 6,000 foot per minute downdraft. That's a lot. You can also lose about 90 knots of speed from headwind to a tailwind. There's a lot of turbulence and wind shift, and of course there's performance issues. Let's say that you were taking off in this example when you encountered a microburst. At position 1 over here, you'd have great performance. You'd have a lot of headwind, the airplane would be climbing really well. At position 2, you'd have decreasing headwind, and you'd start getting pushed down towards the ground. As you get to position 3 and 4, you have an increasing tailwind, and you don't have as much performance anymore, and this picture might not even be accurate. You might be in contact with the ground already. So avoid microbursts if you can. I definitely read more about them in the P-Hack. So anytime you hear wind shear from ATC or from an ATIS or an AWAS, just be cautious that a microburst can happen, especially if you're close to an area of weather like thunderstorms and frontal systems. 
So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about isobars. Isobars are lines that connect areas of equal pressure to one another on weather charts. And if you see closely spaced isobars, that means that the pressure changes rapidly over a short area and there's a pretty good probability of wind shear. Something else on weather charts that you can look at are these wind barbs. And they're basically a circle that represents the station and then little lines that represent how much wind there is. Every long line is 10 knots and a smaller line is 5 knots. So for example at this bottom left here, we have three big lines and a short line and that's 35 knots. And where that line is positioned tells you where the wind is coming from. So the wind is coming from the right going to the station, so it's coming from the east at 35 knots. And then if you see a triangle, like the next one here, that's 50 knots coming from the north. And the one after that, it's a mixture of triangles and lines, and that happens to be 105 knots from the west. Stability is the atmosphere's resistance to vertical motion. As we know already, warm air rises, it cools, it expands, and then colder air replaces that by sinking and getting heavier and getting denser. Now, cool, dry air is very stable. It doesn't have a lot of instability, it doesn't want to move up and down, it's just kind of hanging out and being chill. Now, moist, warm air is unstable. When you have water vapor in the atmosphere, the air is a lot less dense. And that's why performance gets decreased when there's humidity, because less dense air is a less happy airplane. There's always some amount of water in the atmosphere. How much depends on the temperature? For example, for every 20 degrees of Fahrenheit increase in temperature, the amount of water that the atmosphere can hold is doubled. Humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air at any time. Now relative humidity is the percentage of how much water the air has versus how much water the air can hold at that temperature. If you've seen a METAR, you've seen that there's a temperature and a dew point in that report. But why do we care about the dew point? The dew point is the temperature where the air can't hold any more water. In other words, it's 100% full of water and it can't hold any more. Now when the temperature of the air gets reduced to the dew point, the air is completely saturated and the moisture starts to condense out of the air. And that's how you get fog, frost, clouds, rain, snow, etc. So we do care about the dew point, and especially the temperature dew point spread. When they get within a couple degrees of each other, you know that there's a really good chance of fog or low clouds or bad visibility and things like that. As moist, saturated air rises, the temperature and dew point converge at about 4.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 2.5 Celsius. And so what this means is you can figure out the height of the base layer of clouds. So if you take your temperature, subtract the dew point, and divide it by 2.5 degrees Celsius, you can multiply that by 1,000 feet, and you can get your cloud height in feet AGL. Okay, so we know that when temperature and dew point get close, fog, clouds, precipitation forms, and there are a couple of ways to get air cooled down to that dew point. One of those ways is a warm air mass moves over a cold surface and the temperature decreases down to the dew point. Another way for that to happen is you get cold and warm air and they mix in the middle and the general temperature decreases. At night, air cools through contact with the cooling ground. And finally, if air rises or gets forced up, that's how it also can cool. So at night, you probably know that you have dew on the ground, little droplets of water. Sometimes you get frost. And the reason that happens is because at night, the ground cools off a lot quicker than the air and when the warm air comes in contact with the ground, it cools down to the dew point, it gets to 100% relative humidity, and condenses out of the atmosphere as water droplets. And if the ground is below freezing, those water droplets become frost. So I hope that was at least a little bit interesting and informing. There's no way I can make this weather thing into a one video. That would just bore people to death, and my voice would probably give out. So come back for part two of weather. Until then, have fun, fly safe, always keep learning. See you next time.